right, so, w- so such a great, great morning. And I just um, see a couple of friends here in, in the house. Uh, if you ever wondered w- if, why, why I lose some weight sometimes, it's my buddy from soccer, Carl Day. <laughs> he's, I chase him around, and so the, and he's chasing his kids around. And, and so uh, just welcome, friends. John, good seeing you. Thanks for coming out. Uh, Cheryl and friend, great seeing you. And of course, it's always good to see you. Great. Great, great having you um, visitors here in our midst. Uh, so today I, I want to kind of explore subject matter. We at this local church, we explore very often because it has to be the cornerstone of our thought. It has to be the cornerstone of our thinking. And it's the reality that God is good. God is not bad. God doesn't have a bad bone in him. God's not bones. But God is good and he's so good. The goodness of God has to be an anchor and it has to be a cornerstone of our thought. As a matter of fact, I feel like if you ask yourself, what is the most um, under, no, underrated is not the right word, but, but missing element in human existence today, I would probably say it's the goodness of God or lack of understanding of the goodness of God. If, when, when you go to, if, if on your GPS, at, uh, on your phone, you at least I've set one, I've set something called my home, right, which is my home address. So if I'm somewhere and I'm trying to get out of where I'm, I just click home and it takes me back to home. Or if I'm going to someplace new, I always start destination home and I'm going there from home. So my reference point is always my home. And for us, I believe our reference point has to be the goodness of God. If you don't have a grid for how good God is, it affects your thought process. It affects your theology. It affects the way you think. It affects the way you opposite, you, you operate. And the goodness of God um, aff- uh, re- looks like different things. And it, it looks very different in, in the world. But I, I want you to have this grid in your heart that he is good. And he's good all the time. Amen. Amen. So the, the first thing that I, I want to say is that your perspective of a thing will determine your action about it. That's very important when we're looking and we're thinking about the goodness of God. Uh, and author Paul Frosch and Christopher Bader back in 2010, they wrote a book. And in that book, they asked, they were just describing the four types of gods. And I'll, before I go about that four types of way people experience God, um, here's one thing I want to say about your perspectives of things, right? And this is true about your perspective of God. So for, for my wife, she, she loves going to the beach, right? She loves South Florida. She loves going to the beach. So anytime in her mind, she says, hey, it's beach day, For her, it's an exciting process. Oh my gosh, we get to go, we get the picnic basket. Oh my gosh, let's get the sandwiches. Oh my gosh, let's get the beach towel. Oh my God, it's a great thing. But for me, the exact same thing, let's go to the beach is like, oh my God, we have to go to the beach. Oh my God, it's going to be so hot out there. Oh my gosh, I'm going to have to watch the bags and the cell phones. Oh my gosh, I have to look out for freak people out there. Oh my God, we have to go to the beach exact same place, exact same location for one person, their perspective is, it is a great thing. It is amazing. It is awesome. And so one writer says, you, you know what, there's some people, they, they, their value is for pleasure. And so some will hang themselves and some will go to the military because their idea is they want to get pleasure. And so I want to explain, I want to help you focus today and get a fresh perspective of what a good God looks like. Because if you don't have a picture of a good God, your life will oftentimes reflect what your perspective of a good God is. Can I add a note in here? Oftentimes we get our perspective of how a good God looks like from the way in which we related to our natural father here on the earth. So if you've had a real, like in my example, I I love giving the example. I love my dad. My dad's one of the most amazing men you'll ever meet on the planet. And so my dad, when we grew up, he was such a gentle, great, loving guy. And for for us, I, I couldn't even conceptualize my dad doing anything wrong because he's such a great, of course, he's a human, he's a person, but to give you some perspective, when I was 19 years old and I got into my first serious relationship, I got in an argument with my girlfriend and I went back home. I said, dad, how come I never see you and mom argue? 
I was 19 years old and I didn't know couples argue. Why? Because my dad had such a grid and such a grace to be gentle and kind and loving that in my mind, the only grid I knew about husbands and wives was that they have a loving, connecting relationship. So when it came to God and we say, oh, God is good. God could do nothing wrong. I was like, I get it. I exactly know what you're talking about because I got to see that in my own mom and dad. And so what happens is that if you grew up in a place where you had a tumultuous home, a tumultuous relationship, a tumultuous life, oftentimes it would reflect that. So we say, hey, let me tell you something. God is a good God. He loves you with an everlasting love. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on a second. Don't you see that guy who bear me? He's a jerk. I don't like him. Because you make this connection in your mind. And so my wife and I, we've traded um, stories before. And here's part of it. So if you've ever seen the show, Everybody Loves Raymond. You ever see that show? All right. So Frank Barone is my, <laughs> is my wife's dad, right? And, and so he says the most inappropriate things at the most inappropriate times every single time. <laughs> and, and so when we, my wife and I, we got into an understanding of the grace of God. For me, it was like, yes, I get it. This makes sense. I totally understand it. But for my wife, it's like, you sure God is that good? And for, it took her about five, six, seven years after me in getting a hold and grasping of the grace of God before she was able to grasp it because she had a perspective in her mind. See, what happens, there's something called the law of first mention. The law of first mention says how you hear and receive a subject matter on the very first time is how you would judge that subject matter every other time. And so for me, I had a great first mention in my dad. My wife, she didn't have such a great first mention. And so for me, like just throwing this out, I don't know why I'm going here. But, but for me, one of the things that, that I've, I've done is that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be teaching my son and it, it, all the kids are out of the room. Yes. All, yes. And the one kid just kind of pop his head up like, yeah, I'm still in the room. <laughs> I, I'm, I took the decision that I will teach my son about where babies come from. I don't want him to learn from the internet. I don't want him to learn from the kid in school. I don't want him to learn from all those places. So I started having that discussion with my son at age nine. Why? I want me to be the law first mentioned. So the next time he hears about the subject in his mind, or if, oh, my dad didn't tell me that. My dad told me something different. So this is probably how it works. Because what happens if he hears, okay, kid, this is how it works. And then I come back later and say, hey, let me tell you this. He judges it by the way in which he heard it the very first time. So today, part of what you might experience may be uncomfortable because what I'm going to do is kind of break down some of the first mentions that you've had in your mind about who God is. And my hope is that you will compare it to the truth of God's word, not just the framework that you've had it in the past. So this guy wrote this book talking about perspectives and he's called the four gods in America. And this was the four things that he came up with. Now, if you're a math student, you'd realize that those percentages don't add up to a hundred. I don't know. I was looking it up again. Don't know why that's the case, but you, you will get the point in the picture. So they, they asked a bunch of people did this poll and survey. They asked the question, how do you view God? And about 31% of the responders says, hey, we view God as authoritative. Now think about that for a second. One third of the people in this room are saying when it comes to God, God's the one who lays down the law. He's the one who has the hammer. You better don't cross God because if you cross God, he's the authoritative one. If that's your picture of God and you don't have this loving idea of God that would say, hey, when something goes wrong, you get to run to me, not that you get to run away from me. That could be part of it. So that's one view of God. He's authoritative. He's this one that will bring the hammer. That's one view. Then about 24% of the respondents say that God is benevolent. Well, that's kind of good, right? But how many of you realize that benevolence without, um, without truth will lead you to destruction, right? So benevolence by itself, oh, God is the guy. He's money grow. Like my kid thinks money grows on trees. I don't know about your kid. I'm like, man, that is a tissue paper. You can't just use it once and throw it away. And my son is like, eh, he thinks like money grows on trees. I was like, no, kid, we, we just, you can't do that. 
And so oftentimes when people have this view of a benevolent God, it is not usually balanced with an understanding of truth. Let me give you an example. I hope it's not too offensive. So in the United States, there are two political systems. I won't call the name. But the Bible says that we, will have, we must be able to speak truth with love. Say with me, truth with love. It's got to go together. If it goes separately, there's a problem. I'm not going to call the names. So you have one party right? When you listen to their, their talk, man, you could tell they're talking truth. There is truth because God says this and God says that, and we have to do what God says. And boy, you could tell there's truth, but somehow you feel like there's an element of love that's missing. Like I, I do read that in the Bible, but somehow I don't feel like the heart of God is being displayed in what I'm reading. I'm not calling the name. Then you have this other party we got to love everybody. We got to love this one. We got to love that one. We got to love this one, that one, the other one, the other one. You got to love this guy. Make this one. Love, love. But the love that they've described somehow violates basic logic. You mean if somebody decides to be this today, decides to be that tomorrow, like, I must, li no, that violates some basic logic. Because it has love, but no truth. Then you have the other side that has truth, but I can't seem to be able to feel the love. And so the idea, I believe, with what God wants to do is that he wants to re re share with us and bring to us a position where love and truth comes together. And so that benevolence is only half the idea. So, wow, I'm a little wound up here. Boy, I'm pretty excited. <laughs> Carl, I got, you got to get me running again. I'm like out of breath. No, <laughs> then, then you have the critical, the, the person who views God as critical. Who, had, who is the one that had that parent? You got to be why didn't come with an A. You, 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 you lost 10 pounds. Why didn't you lose 15? You, you scored one goal. How come you didn't score two? Right? It's everything that's done there's always this sense of you could have done better. They could, they, that parent could not see the good in you. They could not see the value of what you have. And so that became transferred, I believe, to where 16% of, of the people in the survey looked at God as super critical, as God is the one that would be like, you know what? But how, how many of you realize that God's not just, a God has authority, but he's not authoritative. God is benevolent, but he has a sense of love. And there's nothing critical in the, heart, in the eyes of God because God by definition is love. And then we have a quarter, one in four people. So if you look in this, one in four possibly looks at God as distant. He's far away. He can't even be found. It's like the one that he's not there. You don't know where he is. And my point today is that if you see God in any one of those four categories, that is not the God of the Bible. Because the God of the Bible, it, think of it as a kid who gets in an accident. The God that is presented here, that kid gets in an accident, his first thought process is, oh my God, I can't call my dad because my dad's going to kill me. The God of the Bible has the son that says, I need to call my dad right now because my dad's going to know what to do. The God of the Bible is the one that we must run to. It's the one that we feel our heart's passion to. It's the one that, our, that, that we could model and raise our children with. And so with the idea of the goodness of God, the, 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 the Bible um, says, Moses in um, Exodus 33 says, God, show me your glory. And then he says, let your goodness pass before my eyes. And so I believe that God will have, if you want to see the glory of God, you will see it displayed in his goodness, right? And the Bible says that the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God, right? So to me, the understanding is, is that the glory of God has already filled the earth. That's a big deal. 
the glory of God has already filled the earth. It is up to you and I to recognize that his glory is here. So my job is not to say, God, I'm pulling down the glory. Because the glory is here. And, and oftentimes in our songs, we, we kind of see that manifest, that, that lack of understanding, that it, it's almost a form of Gnosticism where we've separated the spiritual and the natural, where we, 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 we separate and we, we say, we, we sing a song like, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Well, the reality is, is that you're already a sanctuary. Right? He, the, the, the real, what about this one? Create in me a clean heart, oh God. The reality is you already had a clean heart that was created according to 2 Corinthians 2, 6, 2, 2, 18. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old have passed away and all have become new. So if you understood the reality of what God has done, you don't have to be looking for something you already have. What was the trick that the that the serpent played on Eve in the garden. He says, if you eat of this fruit, you will be like God. Sorry, why do I need to eat of the fruit? Because I'm already made in the image and likeness of God. Don't let the enemy trick you into begging and pleading for something you already have. It's kind of silly if I'm the son of Bill Gates or Elon Musk and I go live under a bridge and I'm saying, oh my God, give me some money, please. Share. Give me something to eat. I'm starving. I'm broke. I'm hungry. That is by choice. You, there's no reason for you to be the son of the wealthiest person on the earth and panhandling on the corner. In the same way, God has lavished his love upon you. God has shed his love to your heart and you are children of the most high God. So you need not be begging for the glory. You need not be crying for the glory, but the glory of God has already been deposited inside of you. It's, it's true. You, you really have to believe it. If you don't believe it, it just doesn't work. So I, I really want you to get that grid for that, for God's glory being part of your heart. So talking about that grid for who God is, talking about the grid for the presence of God. Um, if I were to, I'm going to list three questions for you. And if in those three questions, you are speaking yes in the affirmative, then I think there's a concern with the way you understand the goodness of God. So if I say to you, there are numerous abortions in America, and this is a form of God's judgment. If you believe that, this message is for you. When you don't support Israel, you are in danger of God's judgment. If you believe that, this message is for you. Countries that practice voodoo are cursed by God. If you believe that, this message really is for you. Because God is not, those, if I put any of those things in that list, and I were to report those things to an authority like the, the Broward Sheriff's Office, and I say, hey, there's a guy there who is, um, who, who is killing his children. What do you think the Broward Sheriff's Office would do? They'd come and arrest him. Why would we put that same standard on God? Oh, well, be, you, you know why there's so many, you know why there was Hurricane Katrina, you know why all these natural disasters happening? Because we've turned our back on God. Why would God do that? That is not the heart of God. Well, in, in, in the New Testament, the, um, P Peter went, he cut off the, the air of, of, a, of a soldier and he thought, man, I'm doing God a service. God, Jesus looked at him and says, man, you don't know what spirit you're of. So those things aren't part and parcel of the heart of God, of the nature of God. And my hope today is to encourage your heart and to see a completely different picture of this loving and gracious God. And once you know this loving and gracious God, hopefully will change your perspective of him. All right. So I'm going to tell you a story, right? And this is how I heard the story growing up. 
And you may have heard a story growing up, but I, I took a moment to examine the logic of the story. And I was like, I think there was something that I was missing. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everybody know the story so far? All right. And in the earth, he put two naked vegetarians. And, you know, you don't think it, but you believe it, right? You've never thought it like that. And in the garden, so he's in the garden and these two vegans are there and they're just enjoying life and it's the cool of the day and it's amazing. And then one, then God said, hey guys, I'll give you one rule. You got one rule. That one rule is you can't touch this tree in the middle of the garden, no one. So these, these vegetarians, they're going around and they're just having a grand old time. And, they may, and then one day, Adam ate God's Adam's apple. I mean, it was insane. And when that happened, boy, all of the opposite of heaven had to pay because God was like, are you kidding me? What did you just do? You ate my Adam's apple. Now somebody's going to have to pay. I am going to destroy this world. Somebody's going to pay for this. And then Jesus is like, please, no, God, don't, don't kill him. Don't kill him, please. I, 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 I know you're holy, you're righteous, but don't, don't kill these. They, they just ate the Adam's apple. Don't, don't kill him. And then you, you, God says, okay, we'll have to figure this out. Now, is, is that the story you, 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 not as dramatic as I described it, but that may be the story that, that you were familiar with, right? Here's three problems with that story. The first one, the first problem is that that story denies the fact that the Trinity exists. Let me explain what I mean. Think about it. If God is so holy and God's this, and the way we've painted him is the old man upstairs with the beard and he's maniacal, bloodthirsty, and he's too holy to look upon sin. But then there's this Jesus guy. He's okay to look upon sin because remember, he had a tough go around when he was born. He went ahead and he, um, he was with the publicans and the Pharisees. I mean, he hanged out with prostitutes. I mean, Jesus is not as holy. So if he's not as holy, he can't be part of this Godhead. See, I, I, I could see the dominoes. Just I'm knocking the card. Look, look, I could see the, the, the deck of cards in your mind getting knocked over right now. I could just see the deck of cards getting knocked over. It has to deny that Jesus is, on this, is, is God. You, you have to deny that in that version of the story. And I hereby here to say that's that grid of the story, and just stay with me a little bit and I'll, I'll get you through this message, right? That grid of the story isn't there. I want to say that when Jesus came to earth, he did not deny any of his divinity. I mean, let's put it this way. The Bible says, and this is one way to describe it in Philippians, he came to the earth and took up the form of a servant. So it's almost and one way to describe it is Jesus became Clark Kent on earth and he put aside his Superman powers, right? That's one way to describe it. But he was able to utilize it in the form of being in right standing with God. So when he performed miracles, when he did, so Jesus was a man fully submitted to God and he utilized his relationship with God as a model for us to show what a relationship with God would look like, right? And, and so it, it's really important to realize that it's God the Father, God the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. And for some of us, we may have had this grin in our mind that it's almost a demon, son, and holy Bible. Because let's be honest, the person I just described, that maniacal, bloodthirsty God is ready to kill humanity because of someone's sin. And he had to get this kid to say, I'll die in their place. 
That's not the gospel. And my point is, is that this great God, this loving God, the Bible puts it this way, that Jesus, no man took his life from him, not even God. The Bible says that Jesus freely laid down of his life. So God wasn't killing his son because you would never kill your son. I mean, you would never do that. What happened there on the cross? Jesus said, I see all of humanity um, because of the seed of uh, Adam uh, messing up this entire world. And I am going to freely give myself to say, I will pay the ultimate price for man. So Jesus says, I am going to give up myself ultimately for you. That's, isn't, isn't, doesn't that sound like a much better story? It's a, it's a much better narrative, right? I almost feel like a politician. Let's re redo the narrative, <laughs> right? Look, look at it. It says, John 10, 30. It says, I and my father and one. John 14, 11 says, believe me that I am in the father and the father in me. Or else, believe me for the sake of the works then, themselves. It is a union that God has. God and his, uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, mystically joined together. I don't quite get how it works, but I know it is all in one. Here's one piece that I do get, because we, we are what, we, what you call a, a monotheistic uh, faith, uh, meaning we believe that it's, it's one God, but it's in three distinct forms. But God the Father, we which I'm hoping that after today, he's not the old man upstairs with the gray beard that's ready to strike you dead, but he's this loving, loving guy. So God the Father, but then God the Son who took up the form of a servant here on the earth. Why did God, why did Jesus take up the form of a servant here? And this is my opinion. Because he wanted to show what it would look like for both you and I who are just human to have a union and connection with God. Look at John chapter 14 and verse 10. In that day, you will know that I am in the Father and the Father in you and you in him. In John 10, it says, I am my Father in one. John 14, just a couple of verses, it's talking about connection between Father and Son. But then as you read on in John 14, 20, he starts including you. He starts including you in that union with him. Oh, that is great news. That is amazing news. So you're not an outsider. You're not trying to figure out how to get into the party. He says you've been included long before the foundation of the earth. Think about, think about it. Did God say, so what year were you saved? What, what year were you born again? 1979. So this, let's call this 1979. Let's call this 1978. And, and the millennials is here. I wasn't even born in 1979. <laughs> if you weren't born in 1979, it's okay. If you're born in it's okay. So this is 1978, 1977, 1976. This Thelma, 1979, 1980, 1981. All right, you get the point, right? So that represents 1979. So 19. 78, 1977, for Thelma, God hates Thelma. Oh my God, alien from me, get away from me. But somehow, 1979, oh, welcome in the party. You're so awesome. We got you. It doesn't make any sense. Long before the foundation of the world, before you even believed, as we say in the islands, before you were an itch in your father's pants, God loved you. God knew who you were. God cared for you. God's heart and his passion was for you. So we, we don't deny the Trinity. We, we don't deny that section. And I'm saying, 
we must come to a place in our heart where we realize that God loves us. God includes us. The things that we've done, the things, the crazy things that you've, you've done before, the crazy things that you might do in your future. I'm hoping that my crazy stuff in my future is far less than the ones in my past. But God died for all of them. Because you realize that for God, everything after the cross God died for. E everything 2,000 years ago, Jesus died. And when he died for that, for your sin once and for all, it took care of everything 2,000 years forward. So Thelma's 1970, 1979, the 1978, the 1980, all of that was after the cross for God. And he took care of that. The Bible says he paid one sacrifice once and for all for you. So you're not, you, God's not angry with you. God's not upset with you. But God is that father like in, in, in the, the prodigal son described. He's there. He's like, is this the day my son's going to come home? Okay, go back to sleep. Is this the day my son's going to come home? God is there waiting to see you come home, to see you come back into the fullness of what he has for you. He's not God saying, man, when you get home, you're going to get a whoop, you know what? That is not God. And if that's the picture you have of God in your mind, I'm hoping today that that gets destroyed and eradicated because of the love, loving nature of God. If you're thinking in your mind, well, brother, God is a God of judgment too. You can't, you're talking up the love of God too much. I think that we don't talk up the love of God enough. Think about it. If God is love, right? If God, he's not just loving. He's not just a lover. If by definition, all God is, is love. How could there be any hate inside of him? Right? It's just, there's not, nothing. So, so here's what, I, this might shake your theology. But when I hear something about the judgment of God, I have to go back to the grid that God is love. That's my starting point to understand anything. If I want to understand the judgment of God, I have to start by saying God is love. And so I realize that the judgment of God is directed at anything that comes in front of God's love. I'm going to say it again. The judgment of God is directed at Anything that comes in front of God's love. Think of it this way. If there was an active shooter in the room, all of the husbands will be looking for their wives, looking for their kids, grabbing them, protecting them, hiding them. Right? Because, and, and for, <laughs> for our security team who <laughs> is always watching and it's packing, they are... <laughs> <laughs> they're going to execute judgment right there, right that point in time. That is an act of love because he's protecting the group that's here. It's an act of love. So I, th I think it's important to realize of the loving nature of our good, good father that his whole desire is to to express himself to you and express love to you. And he is waiting for you to, to, to come and experience the goodness. He's not saying, I've got a bone to pick with you. He is saying, come, my child, come and dine. The master calls, come and dine. He's calling you into the table. Thou has prepared a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Oh, so good. It's in, the, in that great. So, I refuse to, that story of God denies the Trinity. I refuse to deny it. Here's the other thing about the, that version of the story I tell you. That story assumes that you're an enemy of God. I mean, in that story, God was whooping out a can of whoop, you know what? And we're, we're like, oh, we, 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 we got to watch out for big bad God. That story assumes you're an enemy. And then, 
And here's how we've perpetuated that story. We've used scriptures like these. We've used scriptures like these to say, well, of course we're enemies of God. Look at what the Bible says. It's plainly said in Colossians. Can't you see it there? Let's read the verse in context. I.E. sometimes it just means read the whole verse. Just read the whole verse. Look what it says. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies of God, where? In your mind. God was never your enemy. God never looked at you and said, oh my gosh, I can't believe what John did. Oh my God, I can't believe what, you really surprised me on this one, Kathy. Oh my God, Carl, I can't believe what you just did. This can't be true. This can't be happening. That doesn't happen. Because the enemy, the enmity that has been created is all on your part. My friend, you are not an enemy of God. You never was, you never are, you never will be. That alienation, that, that separation, there's no distance and separation between you and God. In the New Testament, many times when Paul referred to the word sin, the word that's used is actually described as a noun, not a verb. How many of you ever heard that before? Every time you think of sin, I bet you you thought of something to do. I just, whatever that sin is, all right? I ate too many cookies before I came to church this morning. I, what, I had unbelief, I, whatever, I had too many chicken wings, right? Whatever that sin could be. <laughs> I kicked the cat this morning because I was we were late for church and, you know, we locked ourselves in the car, out of the car and it was like a whole thing and, you know, it was terrible. W what's that thing? It's a thing to do. But oftentimes, but, but he here's, here's what happened at the cross. Here's what happened this, that first Good Friday, first Pesach. You were owned by a slave master called Sid. Your ownership did not belong to, you were owned by the enemy. And then Jesus says, I would freely and willingly give my life. And Jesus died and he paid his royal blood. And that royal blood completely set you free. It, it was, it, listen, I know you've been taught this, that God had a wrath to satisfy. He had no, he, he was never, the alienation was in your mind. He never had a wrath. God never had anything against you. God always loved you. And so, and, and so when he paid that price, a transaction took place. So you were owned by sin, the, the object, the entity, the noun. And then Jesus made a transaction. He says, I am now redeeming you. Redemption. I'm take, I have a, the best coupon in the world. And I am taking you back from your ownership, which is the enemy. And now you're owned by him. The Bible says you've been redeemed, not with corruptible things like silver and gold, but you've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus. This blood that Jesus willingly gave his life for. That is great news. That is great news. So you're not an alien to him. You're not an enemy of God. You're not, there's no distance and separation. And your sin is not separating you from God. Because let's put, do you remember that story in, <laughs> in, in the New Testament where Peter, the disciples, they were arguing between themselves as to who should sit on the right side of Jesus? <laughs> If we really believe that our sin had separated us from God, then Jesus did not say the right. He should have said, guys, first of all, stop that sin. Stop it. But that was not Jesus' response. Actually, I can't remember what his response was now, but that was not his response. That's the most important thing. Your belief in our God, your belief in our King is what 
makes the big difference for you. Do you remember the thieves on the cross? Remember the thieves on the cross? So, so there, there was one thief, there's Jesus, and the one thief turned, G Jesus said, hey, this day, you're going to be with me in paradise. Let's imagine the rest of the story. So the one thief gets up into heaven. And the, one th the angel says, hey, welcome to heaven. Thanks for coming. May I see your credentials for showing up here? The one thief, I, I ain't got none. I need a supervisor. Gabriel, ain't, uh, I, I, this guy just showed up here. I don't, he has no credentials. Okay, give him a test. Do you know anything about systematic theology? No. Do you know anything about revival? No. Do you know Bill Johnson? No. Like, what do you know? I just know one thing. The guy on the other side of the cross, he said I could come in and I believed him. And just like that, he gets in. So you mean to say the one criteria, the one thing that Jesus said is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're going to make it? Oh my God, you got to be kidding me. That is the scandal of the gospel. The Bible calls the gospel scandalous because it's too easy. It really is that easy. I might tell you, oh, well, since we don't have to worry about sin, let's go out and sin. Paul said it plainly. God forbid. The scandal of the gospel is that he just, you got one job. You know those memes online where it says the guy who had one job and he messed it up? You have one job. Your one job is to believe on the Lord. That's your one thing. If you believed on him. Your life has changed. Your life is different. And that leads to a whole encounter. It leads to a relationship. It leads to a whole thing. Oh, so good. So good. Another thing about that story, and I got two more points and we'll wrap this up. Another thing about that story, it assumes that God has forsaken you. That story assumes that when Jesus went to the cross, he forsake, the father looked at him, and he totally forsook him. And the father said, sorry, man, you're, you, you've taken on all the sins of the world. I really can't help you right now. I'm going to forsake you. So, and the way we get that theology is we get it from uh, the Matthew passage when Jesus was on the cross. And he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a fair analysis. But let me kind of give you a little explanation as to why that was said and how that was said. So if you went to Psalms 23 in some of your Bibles, there's a notation at the top of Psalms 23 that says to the chief musician. And so what would happen is that David wrote Psalms 23 long before Jesus came. Like it was a couple of generations before. And Jesus wrote this psalm. And when Jesus wrote, I'm sorry, when David wrote that, Jesus didn't write no psalms. <laughs> David wrote that psalm, right? Many generations before. And it was a messianic psalm. And that psalm was actually something that they knew to be, hey, they're singing this in, in hopes that they will see a Messiah in the future. So imagine generations are singing the psalm. And what happens was that back then up till probably, I think even today, World illiteracy is not like 100%. I mean, there are many people across the world who are illiterate. They, they can't read or write. So oftentimes what has to happen is that they would learn things through songs and we learn through repetition. So think of it, over the years, they're learning all of these songs. And so what pro this is what likely happened on the cross. And I'll give you the example. So if I start singing to you, Lord, I lift your name on high. What's your answer? Lord, I sing your praise all right so that might be too hard let's try another one amazing grace 
that saved the right. So you 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 could sing the song. You know it because from the time you were a child, you've been singing that song. You're aware of that song. You know that song. And so what happened on the cross was Jesus started off by saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is a Latin Aramaic phrase that means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But as the text goes on to read, Jesus began to actually sing and record. He, he started the first line of Psalms 22. And Psalms 22 reads, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Far from my help and my words are my groaning. My God, I cry out to you in the day, but you do not answer. So Jesus starts singing this. And what do you think likely happened to the people there? They start singing the song because Jesus started off the chorus and they kept singing. Just like when the mic goes out, my soul kept singing. That's the same way. They kept singing the song. And as they start, as they kept singing the song, they start picking out verses that they're seeing happen to them in real time. So right within the song, it talks about they would begin to cast lots for his clothes. <gasps> they just ripped Jesus' clothes off of him and they cast lots for it. It talks about not one bone will be broken. Jesus, he's able to keep himself up there and not one bone is broken. It talks about... Um, Yeah, there's a, a couple of messianic prophecies, essentially, that they started to see right in front of their eyes. And the very, oh, they talked about his tongue stuck to the roof of his mouth. And of course, if you've just been crucified, you, all of your blood has drained out of your body, your tongue's going to stick to the roof of, roof of your mouth, right? They talked about those that have surrounded him like dogs. And you could see these, this, um, what they did is that they took... Um, sour grapes and it stuck in his mouth when he said he was thirsty every single thing that was a lot of things that were happening right there at that moment they were seeing it happening right there at that moment but the, the thing that we've often put aside that we've said hey jesus is saying god why have you forsaken me i don't think that's what was happening i think what was actually happening was Jesus was literally stepping into humanity and dying on the cross as Marisol. He was dying on the cross as Thelma. He was dying on the cross as Carol. He was dying on the cross as Kiki. He was literally dying on the cross as you, not just for you. He's stepping into your humanity. So now, when we think of, uh, of boy, I just logged onto my bank account, and it is $4.60 I just saw. I don't feel so good. Jesus stepped into your humanity, and he felt the very thing that you were feeling at that moment in time. He didn't just die for you, but he died as you. He died as you. Think, think of a, um, a, an actress or an actor. They, they have a part to play. They just read the script and they play the part. But some of the, they said Nicolas Cage, when he would take a script on, he would go find out who to talk to them, live with their actors who go ahead and they put on like 20 30 pounds because the act the, the job requires them to feel the very feeling of what it means to be that actor and act, be, be the person that they are portraying it's not so when jesus so that scripture he wasn't saying god i'm getting killed here could you do something about it he was jesus is literally on the cross feeling the thing colin renee is feeling He's literally in the cross, feeling the thing that John is feeling, the agony that John is feeling at that moment. He's literally on the cross, feeling every, he's touched by the feeling of your infirmities. And he's crying, like, oh my, this is painful. But then look at what he says. This is verse 24 of the exact same chapter. He says, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, 
but has listened to his cry for help. The very thing, the very pain that you're feeling and that you're experiencing, Jesus, God is saying, I see your cry. I see your pain. I see the issue that you're feeling and that you're experiencing. And I willingly lay down my life for you so that you could have everything that you need. That's amazing. That's so good. That's so good. I'm going to just stay happy by myself. Last thing. Galatians chapter 5. Kayla, what is that word in forgive? Epichoric. Epichoriel. Say it again. Uh, in this verse, it will be epichorievi. Epichorievi. My wife is a Greek native. She's a Greek scholar. So that's why I always go to her for Greek words. Here's what happened in that text. That word give comes from a root word where it talks about this guy who was a chorus master. Now, when you think of a chorus master in this day and age, you're probably thinking about the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, right? That's not what I'm talking about when I talk about a chorus master. Picture a combination of Willy Wonka meets circus director, right? That's the word. And, and so there's this guy who willingly, who is, he's the guy, he pays for the trapeze artist. He pays for the guy who does the flame throwing. He's the guy that's paying and setting up this entire operation, right? That's where the history of the Greek word epikorigeo comes from. Knowing that it, and so this guy is probably the Mr. Moneybags of the area. When he's in town, he's the one that says, hey, everyone drinks is on me. That's probably the guy. Galatians 3 and 5 says, so again, I ask, does God epicorigale, does God who has this wide, radical, amazing, abundant resource give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you have just heard? And we talk about the two thieves on the cross. God is saying, I am the one that radically gives and supplies. I am the one that is the Willy Wonka mixed with the circus master. The one that is radically, ecstatically in love with you. I have come to give you and show you miracles, but it's not going to be by your works. It is not going to be by your performance. It is not going to be by how great you are. He says that those things come in your believing. That's great news. I thought you would have shouted a little more than that, but that's great news. <laughs> The God who supplies and gives. Oh, come on, Jesus. God's not mad. He's not the one that's ready to shoot you down. God's not the one that's looking at your sin and say, oh, you did that. You can't make it. God's the one that's just looking for you to believe in him. Because with right believing comes right behaving. God's not, listen, we, if, if you have kids, you know, in the room, when you correct the kids' attitudes, when you correct their mindset, you're able to correct the way in which they act. We all know that as parents. Why do we think that God's any different? Why do we think that that simple, basic thing is different with God? God's interested in invite listen there is a party invitation with your name on it <laughs> there's a party invitation with your name on it he says come and dine the master calls come and dine God is inviting you into a relationship and a connection and a communion like you've never seen before. When your heart is anchored in this invisible realm, your life's completely changed. That's the invitation for you. 
That's what he's inviting you to. He's not saying, hey, man, you know, I'm an alien. I'm a stranger to you. I don't, like, I don't really like you right now because of that sin on your life. Which parent, when their kid sins, says, you know what? You're fired as my kid. Too much sin. Which parent says that? Of course, if the, the kid has got, what does the parent do? The parent automatically goes into discipline mode. The parent automatically goes into, let's find a way for you to get a grid in your mind so you can live out the identity in which God made for you. Even though he doesn't like it, I tell my son it every day. Aaron, you are amazing. Aaron, you are awesome. Aaron, you are born for significance. It's like, daddy, stop telling me that. I keep saying it every day because I believe it. And that's his identity. That's what God's calling to be. What's God saying about Cheryl today? What's God saying about Alia today? What, does in, what is in the mind of God for Renee? I'm telling you, it's awesome. I'm telling you, it's amazing. He's, he, he loves you, 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 he loves you. God has an incredible love for you. He just wants you to believe it. He just wants you to believe that you're loved. You are loved far more than you could ever imagine. You are loved by a great God. Greater love had no man that he willingly laid on his life for his friends. I'm telling you, I'm going to lay down my life for my family. I'm not sure if I'll lay down my life for my friend. But God says, greater love had no man that Jesus willingly and freely laid down his life for you. That's great news. Stand with me. Stand with me. Oh, thank you, Lord. Stand if you can. If you want to experience this love, if you've never experienced this love that I'm talking about, come meet me here at this altar. If you want to give your life to this, this God that you get to experience, not the God that you were taught, not the God that's right with the stick, but the God that so incredibly loves you. He's not, I, I could promise you God is more like the, the cross between Willy Wonka and the carnival master than the old man with the beard on his chinny chin chin. He's probably not any of them, but I could probably guarantee he's closer to the fun looking one. Right? I, that's the image that I've made in my mind. There's almost a, like a graven image of me, but I promise you, the God we serve is amazing. If you want to give your life to Jesus this morning, if you want to give him your very own, just come meet me here at the altar. Nobody cares, just you and God. Lord, I just thank you today that you're really, really good. You are better than I think, so I'm going to adjust the way that I think to meet with how you think. You're so good, God. You're so amazing. And I bless you and I thank you. Greater love hath no man. You are love. We're not strangers. We're not aliens from you. We break down the alienation in our mind. The thoughts in our mind that cause us to think that we're different that cause us to think that we're far from God. There is no distance and separation between you and God. And likewise, God is inviting you into a relationship, a connection, a communion that will radically affect the way you think. <sighs>